Hello everyone! Welcome back to the RationalInvestor.com's Weekend Frivolity. It's our brother chicken show. Let's just wait for YouTube to kick in. Hello here. everyone! And Welcome YouTube back to... just kicked. So that's good to see. Ah, no idea if anybody on uh, YouTube or Twitter or anything like that sees that. It looks like there's a few people popping in here, jumping in and out. So, uh... You know, uh, make yourself comfortable, uh, get settled in. Uh, this is our weekend show, um, which is in essence, you know, I like to use the dashboard as sort of like a, a running commentary on um, uh, whether TRI is uh, fully built out yet. I'll know that the site is fully ready to rock and roll when I have my breadth charts back and I have my uh, signaling systems all populated and stuff. So. Uh, I kind of like to start uh, at this screen because uh, that way, uh, once you guys see all this stuff populated, then you'll know that uh, we're ready to rock and or roll. So <coughs> I think very much like uh, crypto, uh, TRI is uh, still going through its uh, developer cycle with all the tools and stuff that we're building out. But at the same time, too, um, we uh, have our uh, newest school term up and running. Um, and I was quite pleased to see uh, lots of activity. Uh, even uh, today's, I don't know whether this, yeah, this loads over to the school page, so we don't really need that now. But, um, you know, our, uh, our uh, level oneers getting settled in I had a great session this morning um, with the Wookiee. Uh, where was the Wookiee? Uh, did a really awesome uh, session with uh, Grim. And we had lots of interaction with uh, everybody in the classroom, just getting everybody all settled in on the site. And uh, what I'd really like for the level oneers to think about, because keep in mind, this is just a steep learning curve that we're putting you through here, learning the process. Um, we um, uh, we have, you know, of course, all the pre-recorded lectures. These there must be about 30 or th 30 hours or so that you have to go through. It's got to be somewhere in that area. Uh, so lots and lots and lots of lecture material. Uh, we have the group session, uh, direct contact with Grim um, to answer uh, your questions on a weekly basis. And then um, I often, uh, what I found in the past, and I see it seems to work pretty well, is uh, if you had any further questions following that uh, introduction, well, that, that Q&A session um, that we uh, just sort of dovetail uh, in this uh, broiler chicken show. Um, this was uh, our uh, introductory week, so I would imagine uh, not too many, you know, um, concept-related uh, questions should arise out of this week. Um you know, big shout out to uh, the teams, Jord and Julian, for uh, uh, rocking the support um, and uh, making sure that uh, latecomers uh, got set up on the site. Uh, but if you are watching this later on, you just joined, uh, keep in mind, uh, Rocket Chat itself is going through some upgrades right at the moment. Um, and I noticed that uh, Seward said that it takes like um, a little, there's some sort of delay between your badge on the site and Rocket Chat and um, uh, memberships to kick in. So just be patient. Um, and of course, like we said, um, you know, uh, Seward and Julian doing a great job with su support. Uh, Grim uh, rocking it on the ground as the instructor. Uh, Marat as his TA. Um, I saw him doing tons of support. So. I think we got lots and lots of support in place. Uh, it's just a question of just getting everybody up and running. And, you know, there's a lot of tools and stuff that we have to have in place. Um, and um, I highly encourage all the level oneers to get like a Google Drive uh, set up with a Gmail address. Uh, it makes watching the videos a little easier. And then everything that you work on in the course, you can just dump right into the Google Drive. After the course is done, you may never use that Gmail address or that drive again, but what I've found really helpful for students is, as especially ones that, that move on through the program, is you can just create folders, level one, folder for level two, folder for level three, everything's very shareable. Uh, you're trading journals, uh, your spreadsheets, you're trading plans. 
uh, they can all be uh, stored in one central location. So just an FYI for uh, new people uh, starting up the level one program, take the time now, and that's what the whole purpose of this first week was, just to get all that stuff all tickety-boo, um, and uh, you're ready to hit the ground running because, uh, you know, the first module, the learning module is strategic planning, um, and it's a lot. Uh, we got to cover, you know, sort of what are the different asset classes out there in the world that you can invest in. We got to cover sort of the basic evolutionary um, process or the, the evolution of those asset classes. Um, obviously, a huge part of this community is very crypto oriented. So we have to sort of, you know, look at the different asset classes, sizes, what are their roles? Is it where does crypto fall in that investing universe? Um, and is it even realistic to think about things like crypto taking over the fiat currency system? Um, as well, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time in the strategic planning uh, module um, going over things like intermarket analysis relationships. So in the coming week, I uh, need you to build, you know, those matrices of uh, different relationships of assets. And of course, a huge uh, part of our sort of approach to the market is things like the Dow gold ratio and stuff like that. So um, through that strategic planning part of the course and, you know, this coming uh, weekend's broiler chicken show, I would imagine we're probably going to have some questions about that. So um, get ready. <laughs> You're about to have your world rocked. So um, level tours, I saw you guys were off and running. I expect all level twoers uh, to be working very diligently on tricking out their charts, horizontal support and resistance, uh, understanding in institutional fingerprints uh, as well. This week, you're going to be rocking uh, trend lines, uh, trend channels, high to low trend lines, um, and um, um, all, all about drying lines on your charts. What's a valid trend line versus potential trend lines, etc. So <laughs> I, was, I was very pleased. Um, uh, uh, Joshua is uh, helping me with a level two program. Um, and uh, it looks like uh, that group got off running uh, full speed. So I was very pleased to see that. Uh, and then yesterday uh, we had our initial level three program. Uh, and all you God motors, uh, you should be diligently working away through this week. On number one, you have to read those very thick uh, harmonics manuals. So just, you know, put yourself on a, a slow reading plan. Uh, that my, I think that user's manual I gave you is about three or 400 pages. So just, you know, you've got uh, nighttime reading now. Um, and um, uh, as well, um, you have to start working on your pro trader workbench. Uh, what does your workbench look like and all the various different spreadsheets and uh, mistake finders, demon logs, all those kind of things because uh, you guys are now pros and you have no excuse for uh, not owning this stuff. All right, so that's a little update on the school. Uh, everything's firing on on all cylinders. I uh, was pleased to see that and uh, actually what's cool is once the uh, school sort of gets all settled in and everybody's comfortable there, then Seward's going to start attacking uh, our dashboard. And as I said to start off this video, I'll know that TRI has made it to the big leagues and we're ready to really rock this thing and market this when I start seeing this stuff all nice and populated. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, Seward's got a whole bunch of really cool tools coming down the pike here for us, so I'm super excited for all that. Um, you know, I used to uh, also like to... Um, um, just do a walkthrough of uh, what I've posted on Twitter over the past week through these uh, Broiler Chicken shows to just sort of help the public sort of understand some of the logic behind some of the tweets and stuff that I put out. Um, I think, uh, where was the last one that we uh, did? I think I've gotten into the habit of tweeting this out uh, when I do these. So here it was uh, September 8th. Yeah, I guess that was one week ago. 
Uh, September 8th, yes. So uh, we can, you know, start off here. And actually, I put this tweet out. Got quite a bit of traction to it. So it's not a bad way to sort of start the conversation today. Um, you know, the, the irony of all this is people are like, you know, uh, what's Bitcoin going to do? What's Bitcoin going to do? You know, or, you know, uh, and, and the message really hasn't changed a hell of a lot here recently with regard to the corn. Um, and I got uh, some of these uh, higher time frame charts. Um, you know, <laughs> trading ranges. We've talked about this lots. And uh, by all means, go back and watch some previous broiler chicken shows if you want me to go into detail about this. But really, not a heck of a lot's changed here. Um, Mountain Man, uh, we can change these from 50% levels to uh, RLZ. So Mountain Man stopped the bull on the way up. And that was uh, back uh, in the relatively early summer, late spring. And, um, you know, f shortly following that event, which was quite a bit of a rally, I got to say, usually uh, we see some uh, give at like 38.2s of this range, 50%, but we just went blasting straight up, which in a weird word of, sort of way actually leads me to believe this is a very harmonic pattern. But, you know, I'll leave that conversation for today. But Mountain Man stopped the bull, uh, then on the pullback following that um, uh, initial burst up, you can see 38.2s, our Ray Burchette level, um, used to be an old uh, floor trader that I highly respect. In fact, you know, I've been hearing a lot about this on the site recently too, uh, this whole idea of getting to the point where you can trade intuitively. Uh, that's ideally sort of our god mode uh, when they get to uh, level three um, They can uh, they start to sort of feel uh, price action um, And actually I did an interesting interview we'll talk about in a bit But in essence, it's along those same sort of lines Where uh, you know after uh, listening to Beamish I, I had somebody on the site tell me I've watched every single one of your videos since 2014 well holy for holy so I sure hope you've learned <laughs> you know you should probably hear like Beamish and his reload zones and stuff in your sleep and 38.2s and all that kind of stuff um, so you know and ultimately you get to the point where you just you know I've heard this so many times I've seen this so many times before you almost know what's going to happen afterward and you can sort of act intuitively in the market. I've seen this message. Three reasons for a trade. Here they come. All right, it's time to get ready. Let's rock it. Blah, 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 blah. Um, not quite sure how I got off on that tangent. But anyway, yeah, that's uh, Mr. Burchette. Um, and, uh, and, and he runs an education program called Intuitive Development for Traders. Where uh, and the irony of it all is he not, doesn't even talk about setups in his education program. All he talks about is you know what are the steps required to actually get to the point where you can act intuitively in the market. And trust me, it's not easy. Uh, what I usually find with TRI students, I've been running this program for about four or five years now, and what I find is that students get to the point where uh, working with me where they are seeing and acting uh, in the market intuitively by about level three um, and in our education program we actually uh, sort of lay it out like this um, almost you know all you level oneers that have just joined the course no matter how much experience you've had and I mean obviously you being here at TRI you're not doing that well in the market um, I really consider all of you guys babies. You're not intuitive here, that's for sure. And, um, you know, our, our introductory session with Graham, I think, it, you know, it really spoke to exactly this sort of state where we're really uh, pretty much through the entire level one program. You should just put your money away. Uh, you have to learn the process. Uh, and you have to get good at learning uh, the process um, and building out your trading plan. What kind of risk taker are you? Uh, all that kind of thing. And, you know, part of getting to the point where you're intuitively acting in the marketplace is taking like 20 paper trades with no mistakes. Right. I mean, you might take a paper trade and then you, oh, I exited the trade too early or, oh, I set my stop wrong or, oop, I didn't take profits where I was supposed to. And then you got to hit the recounter back. 
that trade doesn't count. <laughs> so, you know, show me 20 paper trades with no mistakes. And that in itself could take, you know, a good, you know, easily three to six months to do. Um, but coming out of the level one program, what we really want is we just want you to understand what the process is. You've built a plan. You understand setups. You understand a trader sort of mentality. Um, and, you know, one good thing we sort of mentioned in the level one today that we should uh, just have all you level oneers. I, I think it's incredibly important that you go through these human psychology videos. Um, and uh, we do some absolutely great, you know, they're just basically uh, video links. Uh, but really, really great resources. Dr. Menneker I used to work with over at Top Step. Ray Burchett, he was basically with those Top Step guys. Um, you know, Mark Douglas trading in the zone, uh, you know. Uh, and really interesting, this, uh, the, the, uh, this video on Super Mario Brothers, where you, if you change the, the question, you know, unfortunately, uh, when you're risking money in the marketplace, it's sort of like, you know, it's either uh, uh, win or lose. I and mean, if you lose, man, you lose, right? But, you know, if you can actually change the equation to, uh, let's turn this into a video game. And I want to get high score on the video game. Um, you know, and you can do this without risking any money in the market. But if you can get to the point where you're playing the video game to get that high score, then, you know, it means that you're following the process. Um, you know, effective failure. Ironically enough, when you're a baby in this stage, you're going to, I mean, you're not even standing up here. So you level oneers, you don't even really know what it is you're doing in the marketplace right now. And so you've got to learn the process. You got to stand up, but even you know coming out of the level one program, I fully expect you to fall down, um, and this is why it's so important to paper trade, because you are going to make those mistakes, and you have to keep uh, going, just like this little guy, right? You just have to keep trying um, until you stop making mistakes, and you can actually walk around without falling down. And that's all right. It's actually a very normal, very natural process. Remember, you're learning a profession here. Um, so, you know, what I just simply want to uh, convey to the audience, especially you new level oneers, is that you're just parked right in here. And for the next three or four months, just there's no hurry. <coughs> I find most of my level tours. They start out sort of level two here, and they end up sort of at this stage through level two. Okay, I think I get the idea of how this game works. It's still going to fall down. Might even say that, you know, um, a, you know to hunt, uh, and in this document, I think I espouse like 20 paper trades and one, one, 21 tenth account size trades. Um, what I love about uh, our level one instructor is he's like, screw that. I want you to do 100 paper trades. <laughs> um, so the point here is that, you know, going through this process, you think about it, 20 paper trades and then 21 attempt, uh, one uh, tenth account size trades. I mean, you're still trading like one tenth your account size trade based on this model. And, you know, finding 40 uh, paper trades or, you know, like setups, I mean, that's going to take like a good at least, you know, six months. Um, so, you know, level tours, we're sort of, you know, we're just getting on our feet. We're still trying to explore this concept of what do setups that appeal to me look like. Um, and, you know, coming out of the level two, I notice that I start to see the transition in people from... Um, okay, I think I understand it. I see a lot of sort of, you know, like Joe Sixpack, El Tangonators. I've been posting lots of those kind of charts recently. Uh, bot setups, right? But ultimately, we want to get you to this stage. And it takes, you know, that what I found is the people that work with me uh, right through to the end of the level three, which is, you know, mandatory at least nine months. But most of the education programs, yes, they're three months in duration, but there's like a month or so uh, delay between uh, the start and finish of terms. So really it's at least one solid year um, to get through it. But I find that most students um, and most sort of the way the, the terms work, it's, it's a good year and a half. 
And and this is sort of that ultimate sort of image of thinking intuitively, right? The little uh, baby here, you know, child, toddler, whatever, sees something that they want, they're going after it, and they're not thinking about the process of how do I actually operate these feet and these legs and uh, my body to actually get me from A to B. That's sort of that intuitive. I just see something and I go for it. I already know how to act. All the muscles have all been trained and I just go. So, um, you know, welcome to the journey, right? And of course, all level oneers, you know, you should uh, have this and, uh, you know, be part of your uh, folder and all that kind of stuff. But I guess the reason why I mentioned this was um, these are all the kind of conversations around having to make that transition from a novice amateur public participant to a professional and half of it has to do with human psychology. Uh, you got to buy when others are selling and sell when others are buying, which is very difficult in this world. All right, so um, I know I made reference to that in the class this morning and also too we have a whole bunch of third-party instructional videos on here too. So level oneers, if you do have extra time on your hands, but you know, like I said, once the strategic modules open up, you're going to be super busy. But uh, I think that opens up tomorrow or maybe it's been today. I'm not quite sure. Uh, but if you are looking for extra stuff to, uh, to check out, uh, just pop into the library. And like I said, my suggestion for you level oneers to understand this sort of mental game that uh, we're uh, going to do here, uh, I think you should watch all these human psychology videos. So I remember that was a question we were talking about in the uh, classroom this morning and I wanted to make sure that you had that reference. Um, all right, uh, broader market, you know, I do a fairly summary, uh, detailed summary Monday to Friday of uh, sort of our chart deck and broader market. So I don't really need to go into too much detail about that here on this broiler chicken show. Um, I think what I'll probably do is this will probably be a bit shorter. There's, you know, as I had said uh, a few minutes ago, when we look at the bigger picture for uh, Bitcoin, we've been just sat, we're just sitting in a range. Um, so it's not like there's a whole heck of a lot new for us to talk about new levels. I mean, really, very simply put, uh, we resolve uh, this range to the upside and then we can start painting AB equals CDs looking for a stab up top. If we resolve this range to the downside, then my hunch is you got to come back down into reload zones, long term trend lines, original market structure, etc. And so that was really what uh, this image is all about. How, how does that look? <laughs> so this is the resolution. Um, if we are trending and continuing to trend higher, then you can just simply take a line from this uh, market structure bottom up to the rally peak and then draw, uh, uh, you know, and clone that line and then pr uh, project that low uh, or that, that, that cloned line off of the low off of this chart and it should paint a nice target and it I find it really interesting that the market itself has set up um, this uh, this is a very normal trading setup very normal range but fascinating how the levels have basically said that you know if we do resolve bull our objective are the old all-time highs. I thought that was fascinating when I saw that line up. So in essence, what this says is if we do resolve bull, odds are we're probably going to go up and test those old highs. And I also found it interesting too that when you actually look at that uh, old high uh, over here, it's fascinating how um, you know we have like uh, wick highs. But notice too, and actually this should be, oh, that should be off of that level. Notice too the proximity of uh, the high, you know, the candle uh, wick high, right? I'm gonna move like this nice and crisp. There we go. And the uh, clothesline high. I mean, that's uh, literally a difference of like, what, 200 bucks? Um, which is quite surprising. 
You know, that uh, basically paints, you know, like if we think institutions, what do they see on their screen? They see that, right? Old high. And then if we change it to candlesticks or basically what the public's looking at, we see that. So it's interesting how there, there are some trapped bulls up here. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we dip up into this level uh, and then fail. Uh, but, you know, if there was sort of an, <clears throat> an objective window, um, that I think this is a pretty interesting window. And like I said just a moment ago, gee whiz, what a coincidence. And, you know, there's nothing coincidental in the market. But look how that bot target basically is just sandwiched right in that level. I mean, that's almost evil. <laughs> so if we do resolve this trading range bull, then I think, we got a pretty good chance at a, at a shot of the old highs. Um, and then conversely, um, if uh, this range fails, then uh, this would be sort of your very typical uh, trading range kind of market. Uh, you know, institutions sell uh, rallies into the top end of the market and they'll look to be buying down near the bottom end of the market. Uh, and you can see our old buddy uh, Mountain Man sitting there just waiting, licking his chops at uh, about 7,200. It doesn't mean that the market has to stop here at Mountain Man. Like quite often what ends up happening is um, the market will stab into Mountain, it'll pull back, it'll usually check like a mean, um, and then um, it sometimes actually has to burst all the way up to things like lines in the sand. Um, so you don't know exactly how this is going to work out. I do find it really interesting that this was just a clean mountain man rejection there. Um, usually it's not that clean, but you know, just to give you an idea, and actually I don't know whether Coinbase was around then. Let's see. Uh, yeah, it's probably not the best one to show you, but, uh, if we look at like previous cycles, uh, it's fascinating how uh, Mountain Man has reared his ugly head many times over the past. Uh, I think if we look at stamps, I have enough data. Remember we did this last week and somebody made fun of me for posting a Poloniex chart. <laughs> I go, what is this, 2015? <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. Uh, so here was a really good example. I remember this was the uh, the second um, um, Silk Road uh, government auction. Um, the first one was right here. Uh, Mr. Draper won that. Um, I don't know whether I ever found out who actually won this second auction, but you know, here I, you know the point being, this was such a really interesting anecdote of Mountain Man right there. I remember when that happened. That was quite an event. And you can see how we went straight up and straight back down. <clears throat> so uh, what was really interesting about this, and I don't know whether I have that level correct or not. Oh, it's a little bit off, sorry about that guys. There we go. Oh my God, old man itis, I can't even see. It's all blurry, oh man. Uh, I hate putting on my damn glasses. All right, there we go. All right, so, um, come on. There we go. So you can see the stab into Mountain Man and then the quick rejection. And what was fascinating about this and what sort of pretended that, you know, we would uh, eventually turn back up, uh, in my eyes, was when we stabbed straight back down, look where we came down into and stopped the bear slide. Boom, Mountain Man. So good example, Mountain Man to Mountain Man. Um, and then once this Mountain Man was done, then we consolidated, moved higher, and you know the rest is history. Um, so uh, if this is a range, then what that really means is we should probably come down and stab Mountain Man to uh, validate that... Uh, and then, you know, on this stab down to uh, validate uh, Mountain Man level down here, then if you see the turn come in, that's usually the sign that, okay, we, you know, we're getting ready to rock and roll and test these highs in earnest, and maybe we have a nice trading range to work with in here. We break that to the upside, and we got ourselves a new bull market. But uh, I think we're still a little bit early on that. 
So ironically enough, I, I would actually, if you are a long-term crypto bull, I actually think it would be healthier if Bitcoin did come down into this level uh, and put in a nice base. And then that sets up a really wide W going forward, right? That would be ideal if you were like a long-term crypto bull. What I'm worried about here is uh, if we do kind of like A, B equals C, D, just straight up against these old highs, then that sort of sets up, okay, now we got one big ass trading range and we need some sort of consolidation in here. Uh, and I don't know, I mean, call me skeptical. Uh, I would actually prefer, like I said, a nice base uh, and of course, that would bring price back down to cost of production after halvening and all that kind of stuff. And we could justify value purchases. Um, I would say that if we do resolve uh, this way, then this is nothing more than a momentum play, right? Because we know that the cost of production last year, uh, we had one gentleman on the site um, who uh, came up with like a 26, 2700 or something like that for cost of production. So it didn't really surprise me that the market ultimately bottomed around to uh, three grand here. Um, so, you know, if we use 2500, then that means that 5000 is going to be sort of our next cost of production. I think if I'm not mistaken, the happening now is like in April. Um, so we could make the argument that value on Bitcoin is going to be somewhere in this neighborhood here as of April. Uh, like I said, if we just zip straight up here, then, you know, just me as a value buyer, um, I'd have to be skeptical. And unfortunately, you know, I do, I'm hearing a lot of people talking like, Ah, two hundred thousand dollars. That'll be a conservative upside estimate if this thing gets going. And it's like, well, what was the cost of production again? What do commodities do over time generally? They are usually attracted back to the cost of production. So, are you buying value if we start moving up like that? I don't know. I mean, it's very tough for me to justify that. But anyway, it is what it is. So, you know, if we do resolve this uh, bullishly, you know, Brian, he's going to be squawking about bots and all that kind of stuff. Um, if anything, you know, I'm feeling pretty positive that we got one kilo, we got two kilos, we got three kilos, and you can see a potential W trying to come in here. So, you know, I could very easily see uh, down the road. Don't be shocked if you hear Brian, let's say we went and W'd off of here. That you hear Brian say things like, I'm going to front run the bot off of this massive setup to see if I can sneak in here and try and uh, front run this level. And of course, if this level is tripped up on that front running event, then you're laughing. Uh, but as you can also see, too, that's a massive range, right? Uh, $2,750 range. So obviously, it's not going to be huge, massive 100x leverage. Um, I'll probably put the position on to be able to handle this kind of risk. It might even just be like one to one. Um, but, uh, you know, that's what I'm going to be watching for is sort of indication that, yep, we are turning higher. And then conversely, you know, if this uh, is uh, a range and we fail, it's just going to simply mean that we lose these lows. I was hunting shorts um, on this event right here, anticipating the dump. Uh, the little setup that I like to trade, the uh, the bot, actually this is a, a bullish bot right here. Um, you can go look through the feeds and stuff. Uh, I had a bearish bot off of these lower time frames. Um, it just got stopped out at scratch, right, according to the bot trading rule. So, you know, no harm, no foul. Um, and right now I'm just sort of like, well, I'm just in hurry up and wait kind of mode. Um, so that's sort of the bigger picture and you know that's sort of speaking to what the heck was Brian thinking when he uh, put out this kind of uh, tweet. Hope that explains that. Uh, having a great old time in the in the uh, junior stock market right now. Some of our stocks are going absolutely bananas. Um, you know everything that I teach on the uh, on the course is uh, completely asset agnostic as uh, as Grimm likes to say. I love that term. It doesn't really matter to me what asset it is. All I'm looking for is I'm looking for opportunity. 
So here's a really good example where this asset was way up here. And just like Bitcoin, uh, you know, it went through a big face uh, rip meltdown. Uh, took some time, put in some nice W's. Um, we have a uh, an options uh, strategy that looks very specifically at uh, options premiums uh, in the marketplace relative to their time. Um, and um, this happened to be uh, specifically uh, based on that criteria. I don't even like to talk to level one or level two people about that strategy. I don't really like to suggest options to beginners to the markets because it's really, really easy to lose money in options. So um, I'm not even really going to go into what the TRISOF is uh, with this YouTube audience. Uh, other than just to illustrate, we had reasons to uh, to buy some uh, longer dated call options. And you can see, I mean, this market took like a good six months of doing absolutely nothing. And a lot of the junior market was like that. And then finally, things start taking off. And of course, uh, you can see we booked a nice, uh, a nice percentage win because we sell two thirds of the position. So you book a nice 20, 30% return on the trade. You got one free position. And of course, if we hit 50% levels, that option will be worth a lot more money. Um, and we'll look to take uh, remaining profits on that event. But really good example of, um, of uh, you know, uh, remember I was a penny stockbroker. I was a commodities broker. Um, I was a derivatives broker. Uh, it, it you know, and uh, now I can say I was a crypto trader for four or five years. <laughs> Hell, I was a uh, prop uh, crude oil trader. It's the same crap. I mean, it's no difference. Um, you know, W's are W's are W's. Uh, but, you know, definitely with regard to options, you have to be very careful. So don't just go willy-nilly buying options because they're, they're, they're fraught with danger. So kind of, you know, uh, and this is kind of a theme that I'm seeing across the market is that the the junior stock market and the uh, altcoin market actually I think are very similar, right? They're both, um, you know, venture capital, highly speculative. Um, and I'm seeing just as we see, you know, these beautiful W's and stuff come in on these mid cap names through the end of the summer. Believe it or not, I'm actually starting to see some W's finally starting to come back here on crypto, which is encouraging. Uh, it's been a long slog uh, for crypto. Um, you know, and you can see Ethereum, nice little W. Uh, this is um, Litecoin, nice little W. Um, EOS, EOS, which I've heard a lot of people talking about. I Colin was in the call here a few minutes ago. I don't know whether he's on the um, on the YouTube page or not, but actually, uh, you know, as we go through the Twitter feed, I'll show you. Colin and I did a cool interview with uh, his people at Bravado Trading uh, there uh, last week, and um, you know, I just happened to find here's another W on Bitcoin Cash. I guess uh, is Roger Ver out of the uh, penalty box now that uh, Mr. Uh, Wright. <laughs> I don't know whether you could call him a doctor. I don't know, doctor of theology, she was. And it sure is nice, eh, everybody? I don't know, maybe somebody give me some feedback, maybe over on YouTube or something. Isn't it nice not to have him being just a pain in the ass in the marketplace all the time now? <laughs> I mean, remember he used to like be like, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to sue you, I'm going to sue you. It's like, oh, God, go away. <laughs> we haven't heard anything out of him now, eh? <laughs> Anyway, uh, I have no no comments. All right. Well, I guess no. Nah. I it it felt like me. Um, uh, it feels to me like it, it sure is nice not hearing him being talked about all the time. Got to get rid of that nuisance. But you know, here's the problem with uh, trading, right? Is you know, here's a whole bunch of W's. You know, I, I personally think you know if you're actually going to step up and take a risk in the market, now is actually not a bad time. At least you got some structure to work with now. You know, I mean, if you're just going and blind on like one, blindly buying on like one of these, and then you have to go through, oh, Jesus, more Rams. Oh my God, this is a nightmare, right? When's the nightmare going to end? You know, at least when you have a W to work with, you can say, okay, I'm going to buy here. And if it goes through here, then I'm just going to get the hell out. 
So you have, you know, at least levels to work with. And if it if the W fails, and you know, I'll tell you right now, I fully expect uh, my Ws to fail 30 to 40 percent of the time. It's a pretty big number. Um, but at least you now have sort of levels to sort of measure where you're right and where you're wrong. Um, that's one of the good things about working with market structure as one of your reasons to consider taking a trade is it gives you very specific levels where the market is just going to very politely tell you, nope, your thesis that this thing had bottomed is wrong. Get out. Um, so that's why I like working with like double bottoms and triple bottoms and stuff like that is you have very clear cut levels. And really the irony of it all as a professional is, you know, if you are going to take the W, you there's an old expression we used to in fact one guy i used to work with he used to whenever new people came on the uh, prop firm and say oh look at me i'm such an awesome trader he'd always say well i don't want to know about your successes like anybody can get lucky right and not you know knock out a five bag or ten bagger i want you to show me what your failures look like show me a losing trade how did you act what did you do um uh, and uh, the long and short of it here, if you do trade W's, uh, you are given very clear message that your thesis from the market is wrong if the bottom of the W is broken. And really, you know, that's the sign of a pro is if the W is broken, you just man up and or lady up and say, I was wrong. Put your ego away. Uh, next bus in 10 minutes. It's all about capital preservation. So, you know, that is the state of the market right now. There are W's all across the board. You know, whether you uh, want to step up and take advantage of them, this is an opportunity and nothing's guaranteed. But I think, you know, long and short of it is there are setups coming in. Uh, lady up. <laughs> That's for you, Khalid. Of course. That'll be our key phrase. Let's lady up here. <laughs> thought it was interesting um, through this Twitter feed, I had been pointing out that this uh, risk off proxies, things like bonds, Japanese yen, gold, man, these things are looking risk E. And this is kind of a funny anecdote that and this is actually where most people in the market actually fail. Um, they don't realize that, you know, think of Germany in the 1920s. Even owning cash at some times can actually be an extremely risky venture. And, you know, this is why, you know, I used to prospect a guy uh, back in the 90s who bought his uh, gold at like seven, $800 an ounce back in like 1980. <coughs> You know, thinking, well, you know, the U.S. system's going to hell in a handbasket. He didn't understand he was walking into a cycle top, but that's here nor there. He was thinking, uh, you know, uh, gold's a safe place to park your money. Gold's always safe, right? It's a safe place. It's uh, People will always value gold. And he literally had to sit on a losing investment idea for like 20 years. So the irony of it all is sometimes quote-unquote, risk-averse uh, assets have been so bid up that they actually become extremely risky. You know, and you don't think about investing in bonds as a risky venture, but, I mean, you tell me, the picture says a thousand words if I can find it. Anybody who bought a bond at the end of the summer there, how do you think they're feeling right now? <laughs> This bond market's just collapsing here. And, of course, that means interest rates are going back up. So, you know, the irony of it all is that uh, sometimes you can get into a, an environment where what assets that are perceived to be safe havens actually are extremely risky. Um, and I think that's exactly what's happened here. All of these risk off safety, you know, I'm going to park my money in a nice, safe place. They're all getting their asses kicked right now. And I guess the one thing that bugs me about gold, because I kind of like the idea of buying a put option. I like the idea of gold prices coming back down to things like long-term trend line support. 
you can see where this fan is right down in these areas. You all live through crypto doing this in 2017 and then it having to come right back down to the bottom. Um, you know, the sort of general rule of thumb is that markets like to retrace 50% of their previous moves. You can see where that 50% level is here, right? There is 50%. There's old breakout highs. Here's just this most recent breakout high range. And look at there's a goddamn hole in the charts. I mean, it's like you could drive a truck through this. Gaps like to be filled in. Somebody on the YouTube page asking a little while ago. Uh, why do you uh, mention these gaps? Because these gaps don't like to stay open. This basically means that price... Remember, the market is nothing more than a price discovery process. And what this gap implies is that price has not discovered itself. It doesn't know whether there are buyers or sellers in here. So at some point, the market's going to want to come back here and say, okay, well, do we want to do business here? And that's the process of filling gaps in, right? You could make an argument on the way down here with all of these gaps that at some point you were going to have to have the market come back up and fill in all those gaps or basically discover itself through these price levels. That's really what all this rally is, is just filling in all these gaps. So point of the matter here is 50% level, trend line support, Horizontal support and resistance, all you level twoers, right? I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the broadcast. This is exactly what I want to see you doing, tricking out your charts. Um, I think there's a pretty good case to be made for gold. This is the gold ETF, right? It only trades exchange hours, so that explains some of the reasons why this thing looks like Swiss cheese. But in essence, uh, I think we can make a really good argument for like 128, 129 here on the gold ETF. And as I said, ultimately, if I actually wanted to be a buyer of gold, um, I would be hunting things like long term uh, trend line support. So that's all these kind of lines, that line, that line, that line. So actually interesting how this trend line support don't know whether I've done it exactly accurate, but uh, it also lines up with that 50 percent level as well. So I think I can make a pretty good argument for here. The problem is, is that off of this V top here, I never really got like a clean entry into this short trade. Um, and as you can sort of see here, and I did on sort of our daily uh, free videos for the public, uh, I'm kind of thinking I'd let, for me to be able to comfortably short this, I have to see a reload zone counter trend rally and then a nice market structure failure up here. If this happens, and keep in mind the market never does anything you really want it to do, it just sort of does a variation of it. But if this scenario does sort of play out, then I can start thinking about actually hunting put options to trade this move. But it might just go <laughs> straight down. <laughs> Who knows? I can tell you one thing for absolutely certain. Get ready, folks. Uh, absolutely certain. All hell's going to break loose in the oil market come tomorrow morning. Did I not tweet that out? No, it was not weird. I thought I did. Um, hmm, not weird. I thought I did tweet it. I think, um, you know, just uh, the news headlines, if you're not aware, but uh, you probably should be. Um, there was a... And, you know, the, you know, the sad part about it is you don't know who's actually uh, behind all this. But there was a fairly substantial attack on uh, Saudi Arabia's oil infrastructure um, uh, yesterday. Um, and um, you can see the smoke coming off of the installations burning. Um, the blame is that um, um, Iran and their, I think they call them Houthis or something like that, uh, backed sort of um, militia probably fighting in the civil war in Yemen. Yeah, the Houthis. Um, the, uh, and, they, you know, they said that Saudi uh, trading markets are open today and um, the uh, Saudi oil market just ratcheted higher. Uh, everything sort of oil related just took off and the whole broader market came off. Uh, oh yeah, so I guess uh, they're expecting a five to ten dollar spike right on the open tomorrow. Uh-oh, that's not good. 
And the irony of that is is that you've probably heard me talk about this before. Very rarely, uh, and that's sort of my risk on, risk off uh, image that I like to show you. Very rarely do we find oil and gold move in the same direction. So if oil just launches itself higher here, I don't know what that's going to do to the gold market. Um, you know. Anyway, the whole point that I mentioned that was, um, you know, the risk off assets uh, sure look heavy here. And you might even, it'd be really interesting to see what happens here in about four or five hours as these few, uh, you know, actually this is an ETF, but, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this uh, gold market uh, acts on the open. My hunch is it's going to be a pretty big gap event. It might be up or down, I don't know. But uh, if we do go through these lows, you can see the head and shoulders that sort of was here. And I've been, you know, on the free videos, I was squawking, how I was pissed off, how, you know, we never did get the reload zone uh, counter trend rally. It was just a quick spike up, and then she just rolled over. And if oil, like, gaps five, ten dollars $10 higher, we might see gold just fall out of bed here. Uh, I will say, and this is a great commentary on TRI and uh, our robust community, that Julian actually uh, are you know one of the TRI principals. He got off a short trade on the gold here. Um, um, I, I think it was Thursday on that rally spike, and uh, I think he's still riding a short position. So you might see some fireworks out of this thing, but I I'm not going to call direction here. This is going to be a wild event. All I'm going to say is, gee whiz, I'm awfully pissed off that uh, the gold market didn't give me a nice little counter trend rally up into reload zones. You can see we never got there. This is where I wanted to short gold. And I never even got that move. Boo, hiss, hiss, boo. <laughs> oh, goodness. And, I, you know, it's interesting that um, Bitcoin did try to move up uh, on that uh, sort of event uh, catalyst that we saw there yesterday as well, too. Um, actually, that's not a chart. Um, yeah, as well, too, this weekend, we had uh, OKCoin. I think it was on Friday. OKCoin listed a new contract listing. So we had some insane volatility through that new listing. Uh, but, it, you know, it is interesting that Bitcoin did rally right up into this reload short zone. Uh, and we've just sort of stalled up here. So I'm not quite sure what this implies. We never did go through that new contract listing peak there on OKCoin. You can see the cute little double top that's just come in here now. Um, I don't know. I like what I noticed was uh, the whole market went a little bit nutso on that sort of um, on that event, and we're gonna have to see how these markets open up tomorrow, of course. Um, but um, I did notice also too that uh, Ethereum. Um, it had this cute little uh, W. Remember I told you, I showed you that chart earlier, a whole bunch of little alts that were all w -ing. Um So you can see the W down, up, down. This also painted a uh, bullish bot set up off of lower time frames, right? I had that lower time frame chart on there. Um, and for, you know, the people on the site that trade lower time frames, interesting uh, bot level here, really interesting little inside bar. So one, two, three, four kilos to work with. You can see how the market actually double bottomed right off of that bot level as well. So um, I think that validated that this bot was alive. Um, and as I said, the market just jumped up on that Saudi event. Um, and then what was really weird is we just stopped. Everything stopped. And I, I put out a tweet yesterday also sort of to that effect that uh, this was yesterday's. Uh, actually, that's today's update. Uh, well, I got it further down here. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Here we are. So yesterday I pointed out that we have one of these very interesting little sort of battle zones. Uh, and every once in a while the market sets these up. Um, remember there's that higher time frame trend line and I was very worried about people getting long just straight off of the trend line break. There was that trap. Boom. Stop all them out. And then the rule is... Can we get a W on the other side of this trend line? So you can see we go up, then down, then up, then we came back down here. This three bars creates a fractal. 
So if we trade up through this high, the fractal kicks in as well. You can see sort of AB equals CD is going to take us back up top. So what I sort of suggested uh, in this tweet was every once in a while, the market just settles into a range where we can actually determine fairly easily who's sort of in control. And notice also too, we're right at the thickest part of the profile. This is where the street is long or short. This is where people are taking positions. It's called the POC. Um, and the resolution, either the market's accepting higher i.e. break through this uh, 10,460 area, uh, will mean that, okay, we've tested the POC, everybody's long from here, and we're now ready to explore higher. And of course, the people that are long off of here, they will be looking to take profits up top here. And also, too, there's a whole bunch of people that are short, and they probably have their stops just above here. So a move above there will liquidate all those shorts. <clears throat> Conversely, though, this bar, this bar, and this bar make a fractal top. So that means that if we go through the third bar's low, or this 10,157 at this point, that means that that's a failure. And in essence, it means that the bears are in control. A lot of the guys that worked uh, longs off of this level, they might be getting stopped out, but this inside bar failure off of this fractal is actually a sell signal which means that the market is accepting below. And of course, you know, AB equals CD is probably gonna push our way down into this area. So every once in a while, the market actually makes it fairly clear for us to see who's driving the bus. And I found it fascinating. Keep in mind, I did this before the Saudi attack. So I found it fascinating that I wake up this morning and I, so I try to take Saturdays off, even though I do teach a class Saturdays. Um, so I really, you know, after the class was done, I just sort of put everything away. And uh, I've, I woke up this morning and I noticed, gee whiz, we're still stuck in that battle zone. So I might make the argument for Bitcoin that, you know, everything's coming to a head. It's very close, but we still don't have any resolution. And I think in the uh, in the tweet I said, "Wait for it, wait for it," because <laughs> this is and this is often the sign of like a trader, right? Traders gotta you know, just exercise just an immense amount of patience and discipline, and and don't go and assume that we're gonna break out higher here until we have broken out higher. Don't assume we're going to break down lower until we have broken down lower. And now you can see basically this is a daily chart for the past three days. We've just been parked going absolutely nowhere. So I started started off this conversation with you guys going, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk to you guys about because really there's not a hell of a lot going on right now. Uh, and really I might even argue also that the whole world's attention now is going to be focused on oil and focused on Saudi Arabia and do the Americans have a response and, you know, do the Iranians uh, get implicated and then does that give politicians carte blanche to go and launch missile strikes? Yeah, and it goes on and on and on and on. Um, I will say that, you know, I've drawn bought levels here um, if we can resolve bullishly here, I think we got a pretty good chance of uh, a stab up into this 11,500. Um, uh, yeah, that's a nice round number. Makes sense. 9,500 was basically the low there. So if we think of like 10,500 as sort of like um, uh, uh, the pivot, right? And you can see. To, and actually, we even talked about this uh, recently with you guys. Um, if we change this back from uh, Mr. Burchette's level to 50% uh, rule, notice that's 8,500. But what was fascinating was if we apply that same logic to the entire Bitcoin range, 50% level sitting at 10,300. So it's almost like... 11,500 is going to be sort of, you know, a thousand bucks above this pivot. 9,500 is basically a thousand bucks below this pivot. And we've just been pivoting around this 10,300, 10,500 level for, you know, quite a while now. 
It's remarkable how uh, the universe works this way. So, uh, and I do find it fascinating that recently in on the site, maybe you guys on the site can confirm this, haven't I been talking about wanting to hunt goddamn oil stocks? Uh, and now we're going to get this, uh, you know, bloody murder event happen here in the oil market. Uh, and all these oil stocks are just going to launch themselves higher. Ay, yeah, yeah, it drives you crazy. Anyway, um, so uh, we talked a little bit about risk on, risk off. Uh, actually, I'm really interested. And I've, uh, you know, especially with Trex going through all their growing pains and all that kind of stuff. Um, I've actually moved a lot of my personal trading away from this crypto space, you know, whether it be Cripsy, whether it be Mint Pal, whether it be Cryptopia. Um, I don't know if they, have any of you guys ever heard of a place called Mount Gox. I mean, an old man like me, I, I'm actually getting a little frustrated at this space at the, uh, the amount of. Uh, disasters that happen in this unregulated market space then I actually um, I do most of my trading off of my brokerage account now so you know here's a great example where I and I wouldn't recommend this to uh, to the public uh, if I was like an investment advisor because I really don't like OTC stocks uh, but you know this is a way to play uh, crypto through the stock market. This is the Ethereum Classic that's listed on um, on the OTC through this uh, this uh, I don't know whether I think it's uh, actually that's a good question. I don't know whether it's closed end or open ended. I think it's closed end, but I'm not positive. But you can see the trade potential here. So actually, I've been watching this one really closely uh, on the stock market. And um, I think I'll probably go and buy a little bit of this if this W confirms. I think the relative risk uh, to owning this, right? If I just buy this W and risk against the bottom of the W, my risk window looks something along the lines of that. All right. And, you know, just what's a 50% roll? And I'm not even talking about old highs, right? This is just the highs from back in the spring. Um, I don't know if this is the bottom or not. I mean, nobody really knows for certain anyway. But gee whiz, that's like better than seven to one risk reward. I mean, how often do I have to be right just to be a scratch trader if I'm hunting seven to one risk reward levels? I don't even know what the hell the number is. <laughs> uh, it's got to be like uh, less than, well, let's see, uh, 7.5 to 1 risk reward. I wonder how I figure that out. Um, eh, well, I'm wasting time. Anyway, uh, you know, at these kind of numbers, that's like point one four. Something like that. I'm sure you mathematicians on Twitter and stuff can figure it out. But, you know, long and short of it here, if I take, uh, can you look at Mitch if you got a moment? Um, all right. Oh, uh, is that that match.com? I don't really like that trade. Um, but, uh, yeah, we can take a look at it, I suppose. But anyway, the point that I would just make is that there are proxies for me to uh, play the stock market uh, through crypto or crypto through the stock market. And, you know, uh, I think on my public videos uh, recently, I mentioned I bought a little bit of this one, Riot Blockchain. Hopefully everybody sees the W and understands the logic as to why Brian's doing this. Um <sighs> I, I, w I would love to be able to uh, have get us to the point where we have ETFs on all of these things uh, and just simply trade the stock market and uh, know that my accounts are insured um, and, um, and uh, you know, we avoid things like cabbage coin kind of stories. But... Um, I suppose if, you know, like for whatever it's worth, Bitterix is still going through all their delisting crap. So I'm not really in a big hurry. Um, 
But uh, like I said, I, I still think we're in this sort of that cleanup mode uh, with regard to the alts. I would imagine some of these bigger alts, you know, especially the people that are like fans of Binance and stuff like that. I'm sure, I think you can trade them there if you rel rel feel relatively secure. But, you know, it's an unregulated space. The next Cripsy, the next Cryptopia, the next, you know, Mt. Gox, the next Mint Pals, just right around the corner. Uh, and I'm kind of hoping that uh, Trex doesn't go that path, but uh, we'll see. Only time will tell. Um, so uh, I do understand too that we have a couple big fundamental events coming up here in Bitcoin. The backed uh, futures uh, product is going to be listed relatively soon. Um, and so that should bring in some participants. I'm a little worried, you know, like when I look at something like Bitcoin. Um, where's that chart that I wanted to show you? Uh, it's one of these. Uh, where did I put it? Hmm. Uh, of course, I can never find these charts when I want them. Hmm. Got it around here somewhere. Maybe it's over here. Nope. There's a, you know, the altcoins are just, there's just nothing exciting there. I did see, you know, like the, these are like the piece of shit altcoins. <laughs> it's just nothing there. It is like awful right now. Um, I can't seem to find it now, damn it. Oh, here we are. Good. <laughs> it's always the, the chart you just find last. I, I could see on this sort of backed event, this uh, bullish move play itself out i'm just really worried about what happens the other side of that event so you know trade accordingly uh, you know if you're uh you know we could drill down to like say like hourly can you hunt reasons to get in off of this bot can you find somehow find a way to front run it if you are a bull uh one low two lows three lows Four lows, five lows, six lows. Jesus, sure are a heck of a lot of lows to work with here. So uh, you could, I suppose, if you have balls of steel, you could throw on things like reload zones and just work uh, stink bids down against these lows. And if we dump against here, that would be against these original bottoms. You could try and sneak your way in hell i mean you could even just work a bid off of the bot level and say look at i'm just going to risk this and see what happens uh, i suppose the best scenario would be a dump into reload zone and then give me a nice w year and then you're cooking with peanut butter so you know keep your eyes peeled and especially you know um I don't know what the stock market's going to do. I mean, we might find that the stock market panics a little bit with this Saudi stuff and it dumps. And, you know, is crypto considered a risk on, risk off asset? We've had that conversation lots. If it's a risk on asset and the stock market dumps, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's impossible to predict what the hell's going to happen uh, on this oil event. But... You might, if we're lucky, you might be given a half decent little trade idea, maybe especially through like Tuesday, Wednesday kill zone. I think that might be really interesting. Um, okay, so I've been blabbing away lots. So hopefully I've given you some stuff to think about and some levels to think about on the corn. As I said, still sort of stuck in a trading range. And there are lots of little names that really look really interesting to me here. Um, and I'm having just the best old time trading the junior stock market right now. And we're just banging out all these fun, uh, you know, we got actually some really cool trades off recently. I got to say, you know, the CTG, that was such a nice treat. Um, and, uh, we also were playing in the retail stocks. So some of these retail stocks went absolutely crazy and got off some nice wins there. Um, Wanted to also mention, uh, you know, th these are the kind of good signs that I like to see. Where now we're starting to get like ICOs that are actually uh, approved by uh, regulators. So that means that the space is cleaning up. 
And I want us to get back to this sort of stage where these ideas can come to market and the U.S. market doesn't just poop all over them. So we'll see how that goes. Um, excellent uh, commentary uh, by Linda. And really, I, I wanted to tweet this out because I wanted to bring this to the site's attention. Even Linda here says, it's going to take you a good three to four months working with any one new setup that you've learned. And, you know, all you level oneers, you know, the level one course is three eight months uh, plus, you know, the, the break between level one and level two. So, you know, that should give you enough time to paper trade a setup, whether it be like El Tangonators or bots or whatever. You know, are you a range trader? Are you a uh, um, are you a trend follower trader? Um but, I, you know, this is a really cool interview by Linda, and I really respect her. She's so, so down to earth. She's such a really good person. I think that's a great mentor for our site. Um, did, uh, as I had sort of pointed out uh, earlier, and uh, he was here, but I don't think he's here now, but I did a really cool interview uh, with one of our site members who happens to be uh, sort of a, a moderator at uh, this site called Bravado Trading. So, you know, just a really interesting, candid look at, uh, at the market. Um, and you also get to know a little bit about Brian's motivation, why he actually is doing any of this. Um, so kind of fun. Check that out if you have uh, some free time. Put it on maybe two times speed. Um, you know, as we'd sort of pointed out, a lot of stocks like this would be considered a value stock, brick and mortar retailer. They were trading like at cash price, which is ridiculous. Uh, they all just took off like rockets, and a lot of the value names came back. And one guy I like in the market, this Walter, uh, he was saying, looks like everyone who wouldn't touch energy, financial, value stocks, they're all now piling in. <laughs> um, this tweet, and this was an interesting tweet, because uh, I think some people looked at this and thought it was a prediction about price, and it doesn't have anything to do with price. This is all about volume. And uh, I've talked in lots of my uh, recent uh, tweets uh, and messages to the public. The one thing that concerns me about these counter trend rallies that I'm seeing in crypto, yes, there are W's, yes, there are momentum, uh, price momentum, excuse me, price momentum breakouts, but volume is just non-existent. And that's a little bit bothersome because we always like to have volume confirm price action. Uh, they always say volume speaks volumes. And you can see on both the Ethereum trade and the Litecoin trade, it's not like we're getting a great rush of new buyers all piling in here. We're going to moon here. If anything, what I'm kind of thinking here is this looks very rangy. It looks like we came down to the bottom end of value. And you can see that on both of these. We basically are trying to accept back into value. And I think Ethereum's actually got a better case here. Uh, Litecoin still, you know, is still on the fence. I'd like to see the market up through this high for me to believe that we have indeed accepted back into value. Colleen, you're on the call here, right? I mean, this is exactly what you were sort of trying to uh, wrap your head around there uh, in the um, in the level two program you just took with me here. So a really good example of is the market trying to accept back into value, and of course. Hogue's rule 80% of the time, if we come down to value low, accept back into value 80% of the time, we should go back up to value high. So I'm still thinking that that's what the market state is here. Um, you know, traders got to trade. There's no doubt about it. You know, if we look at it from this perspective, we got uh, nice uh, momentum W's. These are, uh, this is uh, actually volatility W's as well. Um, um, and, you know, MACD bullish divergences. Uh, this is, and I think I even tweeted it out yesterday, this is basically a perfectly valid trading setup. Any way you look at it, I posted it here. You know, we had a beauty, and actually this is, uh, I won't talk about it today, but this is how I like to use RSI. I want to see two W's, and uh, this W also too was trying to, uh, the second W was trying to accept back above the 50 line, which of course is a really important proxy for the RSI study. But hopefully you can see the confirmed bullish divergence in the MACD indicator right here, trade location, price structure. 
I mean, if you're a trader and L10 Grenaders are in your trading plan, you got to take this trade. You can see the relative risk reward just on a move back to the 50% level. It's like, what is that? It's like four to one. I mean, uh, how many winning trades, uh, if you have hunt setups that are four to one risk reward, how many winning trades out of 10 do you have to have just to be a scratch trader? Well, hopefully this is a little easier math to do. Uh, you know, what is that, like two trades right. uh, out of 10, something like that? Um, so the point here, 2.5, I suppose, um, the point being here that, you know, if you are a trader and you trade El Tangonators, I mean, it's just sitting there. Now, unfortunately, I think it's actually gone. Uh, it's too late. Right? And I even tweeted out yesterday, and oh, here come the bulls. The trade setup's just doing its thing. You know, no opinions. I don't know what the fuck's going to happen here. But I know 60 to 70% of the time when I get location, I get bullish divergence, I get structure, I got to go. So I don't know what's going to happen here, but I, you know, I would say statistical odds are we're probably going to rally back up to this sort of 260, 265 area. All uh, right. So anything else on this Twitter feed we should talk about? Uh, I think that about summarizes that. Um... I won't get into politics. I think everybody on this YouTube channel knows my general impression of the uh, the uh, leader of the United States right now. But uh, I'll leave the tweets uh, for you to figure that out. Um, all right. So a few people asked me um, for a couple ideas. Why don't we take a look at them and then I'll let you guys head on your way. So somebody asked me to look at, uh, what is it, on YouTube? I thought I saw somebody ask me to look at something. Uh, do, 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 do. do you take the W's on the alts to 50% GAN? Absolutely, Jonathan. I mean, it's the same shit. Just check this out. I mean, this is ridiculous how this worked on Bitcoin. All right. Oh, come on, you. There we go. 50%. And you trade the little W. Down, up, down, breakout. So you just bought that level right there. Your risk to a break of the bottom. 50% retracement. Six to one risk reward. Jesus H. Christ. They're just ridiculous numbers. Let's do... Um, Actually, you know, I think there was a Y chain or something like that. I seem to recall that was a popular one. What was that one that uh, Colin was going on about? Anybody help me? I thought it was called Y chain or something like that. You guys on the call, do you remember? Which is the one that he was going on about? Anybody? Nobody can remember? Anyway, um, it's a good example of one that uh, did its thing. Am I still connected? Can anybody? Oh, WAN. Maybe that's it. WAN? Oh, yeah, I guess was it. So, uh, you know, this one I would be inclined, especially if I see this W. Believe it or not, actually, I like this range there to there. That's just the spring. So I think the trade looks something like this, right? You're going to buy the W, going to risk to a break of the bottom of the W, and your 50% target is 2.4 to 1. Now, you know, uh, with a lot of our more advanced students, you don't necessarily need to sell everything at that 50% roll, but I think you should be damn uh, certain to sell some of it and then move your stop to scratch on the remaining. And then if you want to keep spoon feeding as we move higher, that's fine. You can kind of see, right, every time it's zipped up here, some sellers up here just knock the thing back down. And we might even make the argument that... Um, you know, where should sellers start stepping in reload zones? 
and you can see the market tried to even like close up here and it just kept getting smacked back down away from there it's probably a really good example that sellers really stepped in in earnest up top here but I like, I like to use the 50% rule as just sort of keep yourself honest right don't don't lie to yourself that's sort of a very natural very normal technical correction of this down move and I think that's sort of the trade there. So, uh, somebody was sending me a bunch of um, PMs. Oh, who is it? What do you want? What do you want? Oh, Jesus. Uh, hey, it's Joshua. Hey, what's this? Uh, okay. Uh, Joshua, if you're watching, I'll uh, respond to that after I'm done here. Okay, uh, so I thought I saw somebody ask me to look at something here. Uh, what the heck was it? So Jonathan, can you see how that double bottom and the trade to 2.4 to risk one? You see how that's like an off and alt? Same logic. Uh, Rezo, my hunch is that they don't, but you know, that's just my opinion. <laughs> like that means anything. Uh, he asked, do you think the Fed's going to cut rates? But eh, we'll see how it goes. Isn't that weird? I thought I saw somebody ask me to look at something on YouTube. Well, I don't see it. All right. Well, we'll leave that at that. Um, I think Benjamin wants me to look at Match. So let's see what we got there. M T C H. Boom. Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, uh, is there any letter of the alphabet that maybe might be jumping out at us here? Anyone? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Benjamin, are you still in the call? You probably don't want to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah I, I couldn't touch this and look at the what do we call this one candle right here there's some name that we give this candle right here what do we call that who can help Benjamin well specifically yeah but specifically let's get even more specific rocker and I suppose anybody on YouTube, you maybe have never heard this before, but this is actually this one bar here is what we call a key reversal. It's an engulfing bar, but not only did it engulf uh, the previous bar, but in this case it engulfed the previous one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Uh, well, oh, well, we'll leave it at 12. The previous 12 trading sessions all in one bar, just a big F you. <laughs> so that, that's not a good sign at all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I couldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole. Sorry. And, you know, the funny thing is, is where should you be long this thing? All right, if we, you know, where the hell is the damn W's? Jesus Christ. So we look out at this thing, and, you know, the last sort of structural breakout that I see looks like we got one there, right? Down, up, down, breakout there. Uh, I think, I mean, it's very, very wide, but I think you can make an argument for a structural breakout here. Down, up, down, breakout. Down, up, down, down, test these lows, break out. Look how we rally right up here. In fact, actually, this is a really good example of a cup and handle formation. So if we go, boom, boom, there's your cup. And here is your handle. See that? Isn't that cute? So interestingly enough, this cup and handle formation says that we should go basically a replication of that range. And that is probably right there. Hello. See that? Isn't that cool? 
Benjamin, can you see that? So my hunch is this trade's done. Put a fork in her, baby. Um, probably if I wanted to be a buyer, I really like this as a floor for the stock. It's come down here quite a few times. So I would be doing all my fibs off of that. So the gap low here, there's good old Mr. Burchett. Notice that level right there. You see that? So we always say don't make any grand conclusions about a market until 38.2 is resolved. Notice there's this key low here and there's also this gap here. So my hunch is for whatever it's worth. We come down into that level, we start monkeying games around and then if you wanted to short this thing, I would actually probably be thinking, let's hunt reload zones going the other direction. So uh, there's probably, you know, and notice that's against that key reversal high. So, and I just eyeballed this, right? Just assume who knows where we stop here. You know, if the stock market just falls out of bed tomorrow, and if I understand correctly, like Facebook has built their own sort of dating application, right? Isn't that the story here? So if we go boobity boo and then boobity boo and we do A, B equals C, D. Oh boy, that's taking us all the way down to here. And remember I talked earlier about the gold chart and all its gaps. Look at all these gaps that need filling in. That gap needs filling in. That's what's happening right now. This gap looks like it still needs a bit of attention. There was just a tail in there. This gap is screaming to be filled down here. I mean, look at these levels now. Now you've got A, B equals C, Ds lining up with gap levels. So, yeah, there's just nothing for me to be interested here. I, I wouldn't touch this. Uh, maybe, you know, what I would say as a short is I'd like to see reload zone counter trend rallies and look to short against these highs, not here. All right, uh, let's see. Why don't we do one more question and then we'll let you people go. So somebody over there on uh, YouTube said KNCBTC on Binance. All right, let's see what we got here. KNCBTC on Binance. Now, the only problem, oh, hello, fuck me. Jesus Christ. <laughs> you don't get Brian uh, dropping F-bombs and stuff just out of willy-nilly. <laughs> and this is, you know, ironically enough, guys, this is half of the reason why I like to do these shows and half of the reason why I built this site and why I want to have a nice, robust, nice, nice active um, uh, lounge and stuff is... I want ideas. Throw names at me. I want to look at stuff. I can't look at everything, and I'm still waiting on Seward to build out all the screening tools, so I'm just sort of, you know, flying by the seat of my pants. Hey, what does this look like? Hey, what does that look like? Hey, what does this look like? So thank you for mentioning this, but I got to say, you know, W's are W's are W's. You know, so who asked me to look at this? Uh, Fred, uh, Fred Drums. Yeah, nice chart, Fred. I'm going to say... A uh, nice chart, Fred. Now, as we said before, there's no guarantees in any of this. There just aren't. But can we make an argument that, uh, and you know, uh, let's talk three step process, right? Do we have trade location? That's what we should always start everything off here in this conversation. Looks to me like you're not running into a trap here. You know, half of the problem with, uh, you know, speculating in the marketplace is that quite often people come to me like up here or up here and say, hey, what do you think? Should we buy this thing here? So I am the type of guy that I like to buy against lows. So you can sort of see you came down against these lows, put in a W, rally. I love it even more when they're basically just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That's kind of what I'm seeing here. It'd be really interesting to look at this versus USD and see whether 
then breaking to new lows relative to Bitcoin is a function of how crappy this name was or whether this was just Bitcoin kept going up and this thing just was going sideways. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, oh, and it trades across a bunch of different exchanges. That's good to see. Let's look at it versus USD on Binance. Now that is a good looking base. So not only um, have you uh, got pretty respectable trade location, i.e. you're basically coming in at the bottom end of the range, uh, but in this particular case, right, you could even make an argument that, you know, we had this uh, rally peak all the way up here. We got this nice, beautiful weekly W down in here. If we change that to a weekly chart, hopefully you see that. Yep, there's a weekly W. So down, up down tested that low seriously and then broke out and if anything i love this as an approach is you know you might have seen this and you see it over here and you're like oh man totally missed this man just keep drawing your rlz's right maybe you're here and you're like okay well i'll try and sneak in off rlz here okay well that's fine you got a little nibble there but i don't really see any w here and you're like, okay, well, I'm going to keep hunting, keep hunting. And it moves to new eyes. And you're like, oh, I'm going to miss this thing. Just keep trying those reload zones. And notice, I mean, th I got to say, Fred, you got a good eye here. I don't know. What's the uh, fundamental story? Have you got like some sort of uh, fundamental driver here, Fred? What, why, why are we interested in this? Oh, I saw somebody just said something fundamental. What's going on here? Trade Corp says KNC also has a fundamental reason for this rally. Ah, there you go. It's incorporating a fiat gateway for its crappy decks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so crappy decks, is that in the marketing material? Do they specifically re make reference to their crappy decks? <laughs> Just kidding. Anyway, uh, you know, I look at this and I got to say, Fred, yeah, whatever you're doing, just uh, keep doing what you're doing here. I mean, uh, weekly W's, I mean, uh, you can see them. I'll show you an example, right? In the stock market, uh, KPTI, this was a weekly W that came in and I was just like, I got to go grab this thing. I bought this weekly W right here on this stock. And I don't know, you tell me, are, are we feeling pretty good about this idea right now? I mean, I <laughs> price speaks for itself so weekly w's are the poop man i love weekly w's so this guy moved up came back down and we put in another weekly w here and look at the momentum indicators here that is super sexy and i i i like the idea this is me brian personally i like the idea to look at these altcoins if you are interested in alts look at them versus us dollar not versus bitcoin so actually looking at this, I like this story even better now. Um, so we go back to our daily chart, you know, three step setup. Do I have a trade location? We're getting a big check mark there for trade location, right? Re at or below reload zones. So a big check there. Uh, do I have signs of divergence? Notice uh, we're making lower lows in price, but MACD is not making lower lows. And sure enough, we went and W'd here. You can see it broke out there. So on this event, on the initial rally, and actually this is exactly like the Ethereum one, where this rally here confirms the divergence. Um, and then finally, do we have some sort of structure? And hopefully everybody looks at this and goes, gee whiz, that kind of looks like a letter of the alphabet. So that's actually a really good um, um, example to uh, leave off this, uh, this video with here today. Good looking trade idea, dude. So uh, nice, nicely done, yeah. Okay, so on that note, everybody go, um, you know, obviously follow your plan. This is not trading advice. Hit the like, smash the subscribe, ring the bell button, right? I, mean, I got to say that on all these YouTube videos, right? <laughs> but I'll tell you, if Brian was in there buying altcoins right now, this is definitely one that Brian would consider. 
I'm not going to tell you what you need to do. I'm just going to tell you what I would do. And frankly speaking, I wouldn't have a problem taking that risk. Uh, Eddie says, why do you use the Willy instead of RSI? Well, actually, that's a cornerstone of our education program. So maybe consider joining our education program. Arr, arr, arr. <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> <coughs> RSI is built off of one metric for um, uh, gauging overbought and oversold, and it's a relative um, study. So it looks at price relative where it is now, relative to the past 14, in this case, for like the, the default out of the box setting is 14 periods. So it looks at price on a relative basis and where is it in, in the range of prices over the past 14 days. Um, Williams percentage R is built the same way as like stochastics. And they are built on a gauge of um, where we are relative to linear regression or what naturally should happen, i.e. 45 degree angles, if you want to start talking GAN and stuff like that. So uh, the indicators are built on very different models. I'm not going to go into this uh, today on the math behind them, but hopefully that explains. Like one's based on relative position of current price relative to whatever your reporting period is. And the other is built off of li the linear regression model or, you know, a return to the mean. So uh, that's this simple difference between RSI and, and Willy. Um, Willy in itself is a highly modified Williams percentage R. I like to use Williams percentage R and stochastic because they're a lot... Um, they react a lot faster than um, an RSI study. Um, so a Williams percentage R study just out of the box, it will go into the overbought or oversold zone very, very quickly. Whereas an RSI, it actually very rarely gets into overbought or oversold zones. So there's a number of nuances about the difference between linear regression price oscillators and relative position price oscillators. It's a very complex conversation. And then, so I like using the stochastics Williams percentage R linear regression um, uh, study because it's very crisp. It's very fast. It will tell you very quickly when you've missed the trade window versus RSI that moves very slowly. Uh, but as you can see on the chart here, I actually include both. Um, and, you know, kind of my comment uh, earlier about uh, my uh, site principal, Julian, who does the baby powder reports on Thursday, he loves working with RSI. Um, and it just speaks to him. Um, we could do all of our analysis, and hopefully you can see this. Uh, Mr. Eddie S, can you see the bullish divergence here in RSI? So we went uh, and made lower lows on price. We made higher lows on RSI. I also made reference to earlier, I really like to take the second W on the RSI. So if we go down, up, down, breakout, that's the first one. That tells me that we've stopped this massive down move. Terrible trend line, I know. Um, the first W sort of stops the bear slide, like so. And then the second W over here, it actually tells me that this is a new uptrend that's actually developing. So um, we could have a whole conversation about RSI and, you know, by all means, you can use it to hunt divergences and to hunt overbought and oversold and all that kind of stuff. Um, it works just as well, but you have to understand, I actually built Willy to tell me some, a completely different message. Willy is a heavily modified Williams percentage R. It's not out of the box. It's slowed down very, very much. And then on top of slowing down the out of the box indicator, 
I also put a moving average on, which is also slows the signal down even more. And really, what Willie's job to do here is actually to tell me what the moving average is doing. And when the moving average itself moves into uh, overbought or oversold readings, you need to understand what that means in Williams percentage R language, then that tells me that whatever the previous move was, it is getting really old. So here you can see uh, Williams percentage R got down to minus 84, a reading I like to call stupid. And sure enough, is it really a good idea to be a seller down here? No, because look what happened. Kaboom! So, and, you know, as a broker, guess, you know, and, and keep in mind, the public, right, they're looking at, um, you know, the nightly news, but in this case, you know, probably not nightly news, but they're looking at price like this. And at this point, you know, as a broker, guess when my phone would be ringing off the hook by the public saying, get me out, get me out, oh, I don't care, this thing's terrible, I gotta get me out, get me out, right? And so that's why I call this stupid because usually when this indicator goes into the oversold zone, it means this probably is not a good time to actually be a seller. And you can see, pop, right? That was the time if you wanted to sell to be a seller. Or same thing here, and this one was even bigger. You know, don't be sucked into selling here. Pop. All right, now we can sell this thing if you really want to get out. So hopefully that helps answer your question, Eddie, but that's obviously a really big question. Okay, I think I'm going to leave the video at that for today. I hope you guys enjoyed the offering. I uh, never know what I'm going to talk about with you guys, but uh, got to go get ready for the boy and give him an awesome afternoon. So all the best. And the only thing left for good old Brian to say at this point is a big bye for now.